This steam was made by nuclear energy. It is issuing from a boiling nuclear reactor where in the form of liquid water it served as coolant, moderator, and reflector. Such a reactor consists of a pressure vessel containing an assemblage of uranium-bearing plates submerged in water, plus neutron-absorbing control rods for adjusting reactivity. The water circulates through the core by natural convection, and steam is released through a nozzle near the top of the vessel. The reactor could be converted to a nuclear power plant by the addition of a turbo generator, a condenser, and a feed pump for returning the condensate to the reactor vessel. For experimental purposes, we omit these components and release the steam to the atmosphere. The reactor is so designed that the presence of steam reduces reactivity as a result of the reduction of the average density of the water moderator. For example, the reactor might be just critical at very low power with virtually no steam in the core. If the reactivity is increased by withdrawing the control rod, the power will rise and steam will be produced. If the control rod is withdrawn further, the power will rise still more and steam will be formed at a still greater rate. In each case, the power will so adjust itself that the instantaneous steam content of the reactor is just sufficient to compensate the excess reactivity added by the control rod. In other words, the reactor power is self-regulating. The experimental reactor was built for the purpose of testing this self-regulation, and its most important consequence, the inherent safety of the reactor. The reactor is inherently safe against the accidental addition of any amount of excess reactivity, which can be removed by the formation of steam before the power rises to a dangerous level. The reactor consisted of a core assembly of plates made of aluminum and enriched uranium immersed in water inside the reactor vessel. This uranium-bearing core occupied a volume of about 100 liters. The reactor vessel stood inside a larger open tank, which was partly buried in the ground. Earth was piled around the protruding section of the tank for shielding. The reactor was operated remotely from a control station half a mile away. The reactor contained five neutron-absorbing control rods, which could be positioned by a mechanism contained in the plywood box above the reactor. The rod shafts also contained spring-loaded magnetic couplings, which, when released, allowed the rods to drop freely downward under the acceleration of the springs plus gravity. The center rod, when released, dropped downward out of the reactor. The other four rods, when released, dropped downward into the reactor. To make an experiment, the rods were positioned to make the reactor critical at a low power, about one watt. The center rod was then dropped out of the core, making the reactor supercritical. The power was allowed to rise exponentially until the formation of steam made the reactor sub subcritical and ended the power rise. After it was evident that the reactor had terminated the power excursion safely, the four outer control rods were dropped in to end the experiment. 
For the experiments to be described, the tank was left open to make visible the effects of steam formation and the resulting expulsion of water from the reactor. We will now look down into the top of the reactor tank by means of a large mirror. Looking in, we see the surface of the water and the top of the plate which carries the magnetic rod couplings. The bolt heads extending above the plate will move when the control rods are dropped. The two center ones will move when the center rod drops. And the outer ones will move when the outer rods drop. We will now observe a typical safety experiment. The action has been slowed down by a factor of about three. In the experiment, the following events were visible. First, the center bolt heads moved down, showing that the center rod had been dropped. An instant later, the inside of the tank was illuminated by a flash of light, which originated in ionization and Cherenkov radiation as the reactor power reached a high value. Shortly after the light flash, after the reactor power had been reduced by steam formation, the water surface was agitated by the motion of water expelled from the reactor core. Finally, the outer bolt heads moved down, indicating that the outer control rods had been inserted in the reactor core. A series of five safety experiments will now be shown. In each experiment, the ejection of the center control rod makes the reactor supercritical by 1.1% K effective and causes the power to rise exponentially with a period of 22 milliseconds. The power reaches 70 megawatts or more before it is reduced by the formation of steam in the reactor. In this sequence of experiments, the amount of reactivity added is always the same, but the initial temperature of the reactor water varies from the boiling temperature to 23 degrees centigrade. The experiments show that water-cooled reactors, such as the swimming pool type, which are not designed as boiling reactors, may nevertheless begin to boil under runaway conditions and thereby protect themselves against destructively high power surges. They are not as effective in this respect, however, as are the true boiling reactors in which the water is already at boiling temperature before the power surge begins. The effectiveness of steam formation as a safety mechanism depends, of course, on the speed with which steam can be formed. In the previous experiments, the reactor was made supercritical by 1.1% K effective, causing the power to rise exponentially with a period of 22 milliseconds, or to increase by a factor of 10 from any arbitrary level in about five one hundredths second. The formation of steam was sufficiently rapid to check this rate of power increase without difficulty. In the following experiments, the amount of excess reactivity will be progressively increased until finally an excess reactivity of 2.1% K effective is added. This causes the power to rise exponentially with a period of five milliseconds. Little more than one one hundredth second is required for the power to increase by a factor of 10. In these experiments, the initial temperature of the reactor water will always be the boiling temperature. The amount of reactivity added here was slightly more than 1.1% K effective.
the reactivity addition has now been increased to 1.2% K effective. The reactivity addition is now 1.3% K effective, giving an exponential power increase of period 13 milliseconds. The rest of the experiments will be observed from a greater distance. 1.9% K effective was added here, and the exponential period of power increase was 6.2 milliseconds. 2% K effective was added in this test. The addition of 2.1% K effective here causes the power to rise exponentially with a 5 millisecond period. The maximum power reached was about 2 million kilowatts, and the total energy released during the transient was 1.6 times 10 to the 7th joules. The effect of the 2% reactivity addition is now being slowed down by a factor of about 70. These experiments, although mechanically violent, do not heat the fuel plates to dangerous temperatures. Extrapolation of the data of these experiments, which are now being reprojected for further examination, indicated that the addition of 3 to 4 percent excess reactivity would cause melting of the fuel plates and would probably destroy the reactor. Extension of the experimental data to such a condition was considered important, even though the accidental addition of so much excess reactivity to an operating reactor has an almost negligible probability. Addition of so much reactivity is not easy, for unless the ejected control rod is very large, and it is moved rapidly, the reactor will shut itself down by steam formation before the desired amount of reactivity has been added. Calculations showed that a rod worth 4% K effective should be ejected in less than two-tenths second to achieve the desired excess reactivity. Such a rod was used for the final experiment. It was 80% out of the reactor when peak power was reached. The minimum period reached was 2.6 milliseconds. To increase the severity of the experiment, it was run with the reactor water cold at 18 degrees centigrade. The results of the experiment were as expected. Most of the fuel plates were melted. The pressure resulting from the molten metal in contact with water burst the open reactor tank, carried away the control rod mechanism, and ejected the remains of the reactor core high into the air. These are closer views of the experiment. The film was partly fogged by radiation, and the cameras stopped because of interruption of their electric power before the end of the explosion. The experiment will next be re-examined with the action slowed down by a factor of about 30. In the upper left-hand corner, one of the control rods can be seen flying out of the picture. The bright objects are believed to be fragments of the aluminum fuel plates, possibly burning in the air. The total nuclear energy released 
during this experiment was 1.3 times 10 to the 8 joules, and the maximum power was over 10 to the 7th kilowatts. Most of the fuel element fragments fell to earth within a radius of 200 feet around the reactor, and there was no dangerous fallout at distances greater than a few hundred feet. Soon one side of the control mechanism housing with attached wiring will be seen entering the picture. To the left, one of the control rods is falling back to earth. The same film will next be rerun at half speed to slow the action still more. Watch the shadow just beneath the housing of the control rod mechanism where the flash of light appears which is emitted when the reactor reaches high power. The flash lasts about three milliseconds. It is extinguished before the first bit of water appears above the earth shield. After the experiment, only the bottom dished head of the reactor vessel, which was made of half-inch thick steel, remained in the pit. The upper part of the reactor vessel had been thrown out of the pit, while the remainder was fragmented. The control rod mechanism was thrown some 30 feet into the air. It was subsequently repaired and reused. Damage was general to the immediate reactor appurtenances and was consistent with the measured nuclear energy release of 1.3 times 10 to the 8th joules. The results of these experiments and others made with the same reactor were applied in the design of a larger and more powerful boiling reactor which exhibited similar safety characteristics and which was used to prove that these favorable safety characteristics are maintained when the reactor is operating at high pressure. The series of experiments showed that boiling reactors can be designed to be safe against those reactivity accidents which have a reasonable probability of occurrence, and that even when, at the expense of some effort, quite large excess reactivity is applied, the resulting nuclear energy release is not catastrophic, but is only of that order of magnitude which results in melting of the fuel plates.